You may have heard that the Classic Editor is going away at the end of 2021. But I have good news! According to a recent post on the WordPress news blog, support for the Classic Editor has been extended until the end of 2022! Thanks for coming to my talk! Alright, so that's not really the end. It is true that the WordPress team extended the life of the Classic Editor by another year. But Gutenberg is still the future of WordPress, and the fact you're watching this means you want to learn more about how you can use it with your sites. I'm the principal WordPress developer at New City, a digital agency that builds websites and other solutions for higher education, large nonprofits, government, and commercial clients. A majority of the work that I do is for higher education. I'm going to show you some code during this talk, but you don't have to be a developer to benefit from this presentation. Whether you're writing code, designing the front end, supervising developers, or working with an outside vendor to develop a WordPress site, by the end of this talk, you'll be able to make informed decisions about the future of your site. If you've dug very deep into the documentation or hundreds of blog posts and videos about Gutenberg, you've surely noticed that it was not developed with institutional sites in mind. The priority seems to be adding more blocks, more controls, more fine-tuning and micromanaging for editors, which is the exact opposite of what many of us need. Editorial control, enforcement of brand standards, and an interface that lets a team with varying skill levels manage content without being overwhelmed. In my role at New City, I build WordPress sites for colleges and universities all the time. When Gutenberg was first unveiled back in 2018, I was excited. Our approach to developing sites is to balance the need for control, maintaining a cohesive design and content strategy across the entire site, and flexibility, giving editors the tools they need to build pages that effectively communicate those pages' unique content. At the time, we solved that challenge mainly using the Advanced Custom Fields Pro plugin, especially its flexible content fields. We set up page templates so that you could select from a list of pre-designed components, then populate those components with content by typing into fields and selecting values with form controls. This interface worked pretty well, but it required a lot of imagination to look at this stack of nested forms and guess what the page would look like. Gutenberg looked like the perfect solution. Soon, I thought, soon we'll be able to build our design components as Gutenberg blocks, and our clients will be able to choose them visually and edit them in an intuitive WYSIWYG interface. And then it was finally released with WordPress 5.0 in December of 2018, and my dreams of what could be were dashed against the reality of what we actually got. In early 2019, I gave an internal presentation to New City called Why We Aren't Using Gutenberg Yet. In that presentation, I shared a list of problems that kept Gutenberg from being a practical solution for our clients. By late 2019, I'd found solutions or workarounds to enough of those problems to build our first client site with Gutenberg, and we have used it on every WordPress site that we've built since then. These are the problems that we faced in 2019, and that I believe many of you are still dealing with today. Number one, custom blocks are hard to build. Number two, we need to control what blocks can be used. Number three, we need to control where blocks can be used. Number four, there are too many configuration options for editors. I found more than one way to overcome each of these problems, and the specific solution will depend on the needs of your site. In order to cover as many use cases as I can, I'm going to show you how I would approach the WordPress themes for two different sites from an institution called College University. Good old College U. The two sites we'll be looking at are the main College University website, and the College University News site. The main College U site is the public face of the university. The need for consistent branding requires a strict design system. Colors and fonts need to be the same everywhere, and everything should look like it belongs together. It's important that nothing look like a generic template. The site will need to be edited by a variety of people across the university. Some of them will be WordPress experts, but others will be subject matter experts administrative assistants, and student interns. We can't realistically expect to train every one of them personally, so we'll need to restrict the options as much as possible to things that are okay for them to do on their pages. 
No purple 72-point Comic Sans on Professor Xavier's research homepage, no matter how much he wants it. In order to maintain that consistency and uniqueness while still using Gutenberg, most of the blocks will be custom-built for the site. Off-the-shelf blocks won't do for most of their content. And besides, the editors don't have time to learn how to configure a generic block so that it fits into the overall design system. They need to be able to fill in a few fields and know that their content will look correct. The new site is a different site, with its own identity and its own needs. While it retains some of the key design elements from the university's branding guidelines, like colors and fonts, it has its own identity and doesn't need to be built from the same components as the main site. Individual news stories will mostly use the same template, but the editors need to be able to build specialized one-off stories with features like photo galleries, infographics, and even animations. Fortunately, this site will be edited by a small team of editors, all of whom can be trained to use the editing tools without violating any policies or breaking the page layout. Rather than try to predict every type of block that the editors might ever need for a story, we're going to lean into using core Gutenberg features as much as possible. We want to avoid interfering with native WordPress behavior whenever we can, so that knowledgeable editors can implement new third-party blocks in the future. The first thing I tried to do when I started researching Gutenberg was build some custom blocks. That seemed like an obvious place to start, since the appeal of the block editor to New City was that it could be a visual equivalent to our stacks of custom fields controlling custom components. I was going to say, it didn't take long to realize that it was way harder than I thought, but the truth is that it took me hours and hours of trial and error. First of all, Gutenberg blocks are written in JavaScript instead of PHP. Specifically, they're written using React. I have some React experience, but I was not prepared for the level of React needed to build a block. Even after I muddled my way through by copying some example projects, I found out that some of the things I wanted to do didn't even have APIs yet. Things I thought would be simple, like adding a color picker or a style selector, weren't documented. And even though Gutenberg had been an official part of WordPress core for several months, the API continued to change so that tutorials from earlier in the year didn't work anymore. It was enough to make me pull out my hair. Unlike building a custom block, that was a job that I actually finished. <coughs> Thankfully, the state of the API and the documentation has improved a lot since then. If you gave up back in mid-2019 like I did, it's worth revisiting the process, especially if you know your way around React. But what tipped the scales for us at New City was a third-party solution. ACF Blocks. Advanced Custom Fields added a new feature to their Pro plugin in May 2018, which allowed developers to write Gutenberg blocks using only PHP. As I mentioned earlier, we were already using ACF heavily in our development, so that was an encouraging update. But it wasn't until August 2020 that both Gutenberg and ACF blocks were powerful and reliable enough for us to use them. An ACF block shares some features of a standard Gutenberg block, most importantly, the live preview. The big difference is that all of the block's contents are edited using fields, and you can create a block using any field type from ACF that you want. That includes fields that are very complicated to add using the normal Gutenberg API, like post selectors or repeaters. These blocks are great for our college university site because they can only do exactly what you allow them to do. It can sometimes take more work to set up all of the fields that come along automatically with a standard block, but in exchange, you get complete control. Maybe creating an entirely new block is overkill, and you just want to tweak an existing block. For example, here is the markup generated by the core quote block. The normal way to customize the quote block is by adding CSS to your theme that targets the WP block quote class. That gives a lot of control, but sometimes you want to display a different version of a block quote without creating an entirely new block for it. For that, you can use what WordPress calls a block style. There's a good chance you've noticed these before on some of the core blocks. Most people who chose to listen to this talk probably hate them. Don't worry, I'm going to show you how to turn them off later, but for now, I'm going to talk about how you can use them to your advantage. Block styles are added to the Gutenberg interface with JavaScript. I'll show you how to make a new style later. For now, you should know that they're nothing more than a CSS class applied to a block. For example, I could add a block style for block quotes called with quotation marks. 
when this style is selected, it adds a class called isStyle with quotation marks, which I have defined in my style sheet to add quotation marks to the before and after pseudo classes on the paragraph element. Anything that you can control by adding a single CSS class can be controlled by a block style. Sometimes CSS isn't enough, and you need to modify the markup as well. For that, you can use the render block filter. The render block filter is good for adding wrappers around your block content, or putting extra markup before or after it. In this example, I applied some Tailwind style utility classes that would add a padded blue background around the quote. For the college university news site, our priorities are different. All of the editors know how to use Gutenberg because we've trained them, and they understand the importance of maintaining brand guidelines and not breaking our responsive layout because we've threatened them. I mean, trained them. For this team, the balance of flexibility versus consistency that we want leans more toward flexibility. We might still want to use some ACF blocks, but they might be stricter than necessary, except where you can't create what you need any other way. For this site, the solution to custom blocks are hard to build could be don't build custom blocks. Instead of creating a custom block, you can take an existing block or set of blocks, pre-configure all of their settings, and save that configuration as a code in your theme or in a plugin. That's called a block pattern. Suppose I wanted to create a page header using the core cover block. The first time I set this up, I would need to add the block to my page. I want to insert the post title, but this add title placeholder won't accept it as a value. I'll have to add it in its own paragraph instead. And change it to an h1. Then add my description. To turn this cover into a block pattern, I need to open up the code editor for the page where I can grab the raw markup for the block. In my theme, I'm going to use the register block pattern function to set a new block pattern called page header cover. For the content, I'm going to paste in the markup I copied from the block editor, but I have a few changes to make first. There are settings I can change in the markup that I couldn't change in the editor. I didn't put anything into the add title placeholder, but I couldn't delete it either. I can remove it from the markup now. I can also add a placeholder to the description field using an attribute, and then I can delete the sample text I put in there before. The last thing I need to do is escape out all of the quotation marks, so I can use this markup as a string in my pattern attributes in PHP. When you register a block pattern for the first time, it enables the Patterns tab on the block inserter. If I assigned my pattern to a category, it will appear under that category. Otherwise, it will be listed as uncategorized. And here's what my pattern looks like when I add it to the editor, all ready for my content. By default, WordPress fills the Patterns tab with a bunch of pre-built block patterns that are definitely not going to fit your design system. You can turn those off by removing support for core block patterns in your theme. If you need to use a small number of custom blocks, but you want to use block patterns most of the time, there's no reason you can't use both. You can even create block patterns from custom blocks. But if you do that with ACF blocks, there is one major limitation. Regular Gutenberg blocks store all of their configuration and content as part of the block markup, but ACF blocks store their information in the database. If you try to change the settings on an ACF block and then create a block pattern from it, those settings will not stay set when you create a new instance of that pattern. You can use block patterns to combine sets of ACF blocks, but you can't use them to save a specific configuration for an ACF block. If you want to maintain any control at all over the look and feel of your site, you need to have some control over which blocks are available in the editor. You can selectively hide blocks in order to guide editors toward the blocks that they're likely to need, or you can completely lock out any blocks that you haven't personally approved. When it comes to blocking features in WordPress, I recommend using the least intrusive method that meets all of your needs. For this problem, I'm going to start with the news site, which has less restrictive requirements, and move on to the more restrictive solutions as we go. Since the news site editors are all skilled and trustworthy, the least technical solution 
would be to leave all the blocks enabled, and provide editors with guidance on what blocks they should use and for what purposes. You can also teach them how to hide blocks themselves using the block manager, so they can avoid inappropriate blocks most of the time, but re-enable them for edge cases that call for them. If you want to enforce which blocks are disabled, I recommend using a plugin designed for the purpose. At the moment, my preferred plugin is the Gutenberg Block Manager plugin. It lets you globally turn blocks on or off from its settings page, but what I find even more useful is that it provides a filter that you can use to disable blocks from your theme. You can even set conditions for when the blocks are disabled. Disabling blocks one by one will let you get rid of the blocks already installed on your site, but it won't do anything about blocks that get added later, either by a WordPress update or by plugins. If you absolutely cannot allow unauthorized blocks on your site, you can go the opposite way and specify which blocks to allow. For this, we can use the Allowed Block Types All filter, which accepts and returns a list of allowed blocks. Once you set this filter to use a callback, no blocks will be available in the editor unless they're listed here. That means someone will have to keep the list up to date if new blocks are added in the future. You can also use conditionals with this filter, which lets you do things like enable a different set of blocks for a custom post type. One important catch to this approach is that everything is a block under Gutenberg, including lots of things you might otherwise lump under rich text, like paragraphs, lists, headings, tables, and so on. If you don't include them in the list, they won't be available anywhere. You might also need to enable the core block called simply block to enable reusable blocks, and the group block to let your users use the grouping feature. Before Gutenberg, New City's WordPress sites usually had templates that had required content sections. For example, we would set up the page template so that every page would have a required page header and a required content section. We might also add a couple of sections that are optional, but fixed in place. In this example, I've added a call to action section and an email signup form. These sections are both optional, a page doesn't have to have either of them, but when they are used, the call to action always goes above the content, and the email form always goes after the content. For the most flexible templates, we would also include sections that could include any combination of components, chosen from a predefined set of components. The components can go in any order within the section, but they cannot be placed outside of the section. Gutenberg doesn't work like that. When you're in the page editor, everything you see is part of one big block called content. By default, an editor can add any available block in any order, but that won't work for our design. We need the call to action at the top and the email form at the bottom, but there's nothing stopping someone from reversing that or putting one of them in the middle of the content. For the college university news site, there's only one page header style and the editors know what it looks like. So it's not important that they be able to see it in the page editor. This removes the need to make the page header into a Gutenberg block at all and we can make it a template part instead. We can put the page header into the page template above the content, and we don't have to worry about it anymore for the purposes of this example. The email form at the bottom is only slightly more complicated. The contents of the section won't change no matter what page it's on, so we can make that a template part too, or maybe even incorporate it into the footer. I did say earlier that this form is optional though, so we need a control to enable or disable it. For that, a custom field with a checkbox will work perfectly. I use ACF to create custom fields, but any method will work as long as it stores a meta value that you can access from the template file. Great, that's one more piece moved out of our editor. The call to action at the top is more troublesome because the text and button can change from one page to another. I can think of a couple of solutions for this setup. One solution is to do exactly what we did for the email form. We can make the call to action into a template part that goes directly beneath the page header, and we can use custom fields in the pages sidebar to set the content that goes into it. That works, but it has some drawbacks. One is that you can't see a live preview of the call to action. That didn't matter as much with the header in the email form because they never change, but it would be nice to see a preview of this section as we change its content. Also, you have to make the call to action a completely custom component. If you wanted to build it using a block pattern, you couldn't use this method. 
A second solution would be to make the call to action a custom block or a block pattern and let the editors add it as they see fit. This increases the chance that it will be misused, but that can be helped with training. If it's a custom block, you can also register it with the multiple value set to false. That will prevent more than one instance of the call to action from being used on the same page. That anything goes approach to layout might work for the news site, but over at the main university site, we can't allow that kind of freedom without risking ugly or broken layouts. Gutenberg block templates are kind of like block patterns in that they're predefined sets of blocks. But where block patterns are meant to be dropped into a post and treated like a normal block, a block template is meant to be used as a starting point for post content. To create a template for all pages that looks like our example, we could use something like this to place a custom page header, call to action, and email form, and put an empty paragraph block between them where the main content blocks can be placed. While this would set up the correct blocks, it has a major shortcoming. The blocks can be moved around or deleted without any restrictions. WordPress allows us some control over this with the template lock property, which you can add like so. Template lock has three possible values. If it's not set at all, then the template is not locked. A setting of all will prevent all changes to the block set. Nobody will be able to add, delete, or move the blocks. This won't work for us because we need to be able to replace that middle paragraph and probably add more blocks as well. A setting of insert will not allow deleting or adding any blocks, but it will allow the blocks to be moved around. You may recognize this as almost the exact opposite of what we need. What we need is a way to lock the position of the template blocks, but allow insertion and moving of new blocks. At the moment, there are no template settings to do that. But we can build it ourselves using a combination of block templates, allowed blocks settings, and a custom block using inner blocks. Inner blocks is a feature of Gutenberg blocks that lets you leave a slot inside a block where additional blocks can be nested. A good block example for visualizing this is the columns block. A columns block has one or more nested columns directly inside it, and each column is a simple wrapper with inner blocks. When you add content to a column, you are inserting it into the inner block section of that column. To make our page layout work, we're going to set up almost exactly what we did before, but we're going to set the template lock to all and change the placeholder paragraph to a new custom block that we'll be building. Now we need to register our new block. I'm not going to give a direct code example for this because the block can be built with JavaScript, ACF blocks, or any other method that you use to register new blocks. The important part is the settings. You need to name it so that it matches the block you added to your page template, and you want to limit it to one per page. Then you need to give it an inner block section. Inner block sections can have templates of their own. For this one, I suggest giving it a single paragraph as a starting block so that editors have something to click on to start adding blocks. Finally, you can list the allowed blocks for this inner block. You can leave this out if you want the page content area to support the same blocks that the page post type supports. If you do define the allowed blocks, make sure to include the paragraph block. By the way, you can't enable a block type for an inner block that is not enabled for the post type, so make sure that you haven't disabled any of the blocks you need at a higher level. This is a very strict approach, and I only recommend it if you need complete control over all page layouts. It pushes against Gutenberg's native behavior in ways that sometimes cause unexpected problems, and I don't expect that future versions of WordPress are going to prioritize fixing that. If you can accomplish the same thing through training and enforcing content policies instead, I highly recommend that you do it that way. I've saved the best for last. This is the complaint that I hear more than any other from theme developers at colleges and universities and at agencies like mine. I can't figure out how to turn off all these controls. Like I said at the beginning, Gutenberg wasn't created with us in mind. If it had been, the core blocks wouldn't come with custom color selectors, font selectors, weird style options, and other tools specifically designed to let editors break the global style settings for our themes. At the very least, they would have included an easy way to disable all of it at once. But no, 
we have to deal with this mess on our own. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of how you can shut off some of the most troublesome controls. WordPress core blocks come with some strange block styles built in. Some are useless, and others are so bad that it's baffling they were ever included. Fortunately, there's now a JavaScript function called unregister block style. This script will remove all of the built-in block styles for the image block. To use it, you need to include it as a JavaScript file in your theme or plugin, then enqueue it using the enqueue block editor assets hook. When you enqueue it, make sure to include the dependencies shown here, and put it in the site footer, not the header. I've added a link to the slides that will show you a complete list of core block styles that you can disable with this method. Adding a block style is pretty much the same process, this time using the register block style function. This code here would create the example quote style I showed when I was talking about customizing blocks. You can put this in a separate add block styles file and enqueue it the same way as the remove block styles script. I tend to put them together into one add and remove block styles file instead, so it's easier to see what I've added and removed at a glance. Lots of core WordPress blocks have settings like this, which give editors the ability to choose from a set of font sizes and colors, and worst of all, to enter completely custom values for them. Depending on your starter theme, some of these settings may already be disabled, but there's a way to manage a bunch of them all in the same place. I give WordPress a hard time, but I have to give them some credit. They have been making this process easier over time. If I had given this talk three months ago, I wouldn't have been able to show you this next solution because it didn't exist yet. As of WordPress 5.8, you can add a file called theme.json to the root of your theme directory that you can use to control certain settings in the editor. I recommend that you look into all the things you can do with it, but I'm going to focus on the color and typography settings. Before I start, I should warn you, an incorrectly formatted theme.json file will crash your site. If you put a comma in the wrong place, you're likely to get a white screen of death. Always test changes to this file on a non-production site first. A theme.json file looks like this. The settings object is where you can modify the behavior of the Gutenberg editor. The snippets I show from now on will mostly be out of context, so keep in mind that when I put something into color, I'm actually putting it into settings color. Starting with typography, the first thing I always do is turn off the drop cap toggle. I will never understand why WordPress thought it necessary to add drop cap as a core WordPress feature, but at least it's easy to disable here. Next, I want to remove the font size selector, which I do by setting font sizes to an empty array. By the way, don't set it to false, or you'll trigger an error. With these two values set, the typography panel should disappear completely. If you want to give some control over font sizes, but limit it to sizes that you set yourself, you can add those sizes to the font sizes array. This brings back the sizes dropdown, but it also brings back the custom size field. That's no good. We can remove it again by setting custom font size to false. Color works much the same way. Unlike with font sizes though, setting the palette options to empty does not automatically hide the custom color selectors. To do that, you need to explicitly turn custom colors off. When you do that, the entire color panel disappears from the editor. Also like the font sizes, you can add a custom palette of colors back in manually. Be sure to leave custom set to false unless you want to enable arbitrary color selection. Gutenberg was in a pretty rough state when it launched, and it left a bad impression on a lot of WordPress developers and users that still hasn't gone away. If you've been hesitant to make the change until now, I totally get it. But Gutenberg has improved a lot in a short amount of time. And the techniques I demonstrated today address a lot of the remaining problems that made it impractical before. If you're building or redesigning a WordPress site, now is a good time to consider switching to Gutenberg. It's only going to get better from here.